right, 24 minutes before 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Spies of No Country, Secret Lives at the Birth of Israel is the title of the book we're about to speak about. The author, Matty Friedman, is on the phone. He is a journalist, a contributor to the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The New York Times. And uh, his new book, Spies of No Country, is getting rave reviews on Amazon. Uh, it's available as uh, in kind of every form. I think I even saw it as an audio book. Yep, there it is right there. Let's say hello to Maddie and find out what this is about. Good morning, Maddie Friedman. Thank you for being on the show with us today. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Where are you calling from? I am in Jerusalem, Israel. You're in Jerusalem. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's a cool thing to be able to say. How, how is the climate there? I don't mean uh, like the weatherman, but I mean the political climate. How is it? Well, the uh, the weatherman climate is really, really hot. Uh, the political climate here is always pretty exciting. Um, this week's actually been pretty uh, pretty laid back by our standards, probably pretty tense by American standards, but for Israelis, it's been a pretty quiet week. So Israel is one of those nations that has, I guess, two births, you could say, the, the one in, from 1948 or so, and then the other one, like, 2,000 years ago, <laughs> right? Um do you, That's right. There, there are a lot of layers here, and it depends where you want to start counting. <laughs> so, so tell me about the book. You're, you're looking, obviously, at spies from what year, 1948? That's right. This book is the true story of Israel's first spies in 1948, which is the year that the state is founded in a war that we call the War of Independence. And the book tracks four very young men, teenagers in some cases, or people barely out of their teens, who get wow. recruited by an early version of Israeli intelligence before there's a Mossad, before there's an Israeli army, before there's a state of Israel, and they get sent off into the Arab world as spies. Now, were, were the countries they would be spying against be Arabic in nation, or would they be European, especially back in those days? These spies were used against Arab countries, and what makes them interesting is that the spies themselves came from Arab countries. So when people tell the story of Israel, usually they're telling a pretty European story. So they know about Theodore Herzl, maybe, or, or uh, pogroms in Europe, and the kibbutz idea, the socialist idea, and of course the Holocaust looms very large in, in Israeli history, but about half of Israel's Jewish population today comes from the Islamic world people native to the Middle East, cities like Casablanca, Aleppo, Baghdad. Right, right. Baghdad, for example, was one-third Jewish in the 1940s. So about a million Jews in the Islamic world end up being displaced. Most of them come to Israel, and these spies were native to the Arab world. They had native Arabic they could pass on the other side of the enemy lines, and that's what made them useful in a war against the Arab world in 1948. Were they uh, drafted, or, or did they do this because they, they wanted to... Uh, it sh show support for the country that they were waiting to happen? Because I, I, I know that there was a, a big hope that this would eventually happen back in the early 40s. That's right. These guys were volunteers. They actually come to Israel before the state is founded. They, most of them end up here in the early 1940s and become part of the Jewish military underground. And at that time, most of the Jews in the country came from Europe, mainly Eastern Europe. And these guys were unique because they were native to the Middle East and they could speak Arabic. And that made them effective as gatherers of intelligence. And they join a very amateurish, kind of ad hoc, mm -hmm. seat of the pants type um, outfit called the Arab section, which is made up of Jews who are native to the Arab world, who are then sent back into the Arab world to spy on it. So they, they do it as volunteers. It's very dangerous work of about a dozen of these guys who are active at the beginning of the 1948 war. Half of them are caught and executed. The other half kind of barely, um, barely make it out. Um, it was kind of a treacherous time, and they knew that they might pay with their lives for the work that they were doing, and they went off to do it anyway, which is one of the amazing wow. things about them. So and uh, they were sought out and assembled by the British? That's right. The, the origins of this very interesting operation called the Arab Section are actually with the British in 1941. So 1941 is really the darkest moment of World War II. The Americans are still sitting out the war. The Germans are advancing on all fronts. Things look very bleak, and it seems likely that the German army is about to capture this country, which was then called the British Mandate Territory of Palestine. And the British kind of freak out, and the Jews here also freak out because it's clear what will happen if the Germans 
succeed in in capturing the country and the British realized that the, the Jewish population here could be useful to them in their war effort because the Jews have an ability to pass for other nations. For example, you have a minority of people here who are Jews from Germany who can pass as Germans. They speak perfect German. And the British train a small unit of these guys to pass as German soldiers. They train them in Nazi uniforms. They train them to sing German army songs. And they're supposed to operate behind German lines as Germans. And that's called the German section. And at the same time, they found a unit called the Arab section, which is made up of Arabic-speaking Jews who are supposed to function behind enemy lines in the Arab world. It's the tide of the war changes, of course, in 1941, and the Germans never arrive here, and the Americans enter the war, and El Alamein changes the war in the Middle East, and Stalingrad mm. changes the war uh, in, in Russia. So things, things change, and the German section is disbanded because it's no longer necessary, but the Arab section is kept as part of the Jewish military underground because the Zionist leadership understands that eventually there's going to be a war with the Arab world, and if you're facing a war with the Arab world, then you better have people who can gather intelligence. How is the Jewish... Um culture uh, preserved all those the, a couple thousand years w without a country how how did that stay preserved and and, how, and was it a was it was there a time when uh, the Jewish culture that is part of Israel today um, was was almost foreign to some of the people who lived there right the story of Jewish survival in the past is a very interesting one because most nations are bound by geography, right? People live in the same place, and they right. share a system of government, and they usually share a language. But that wasn't the case with Jewish people for about 2,000 years. People wow. were scattered all over the place, and they were living in Syria, and in Lebanon, and in Egypt, and in Poland, and in Russia, and eventually in, you know, in New York, and in Toronto, which, yeah, is, where yeah. I, which yeah. is where I grew up. And what binds this very strange kind of scattered people is is a religion and a culture and a kind of shared understanding of, of religious texts, mainly the Bible, the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And this keeps things going over many, many centuries when people have very little to do with each other. The communities have very, very little contact. Mm -hmm. And then in the early 1900s, the Zionist movement really gets moving with this idea of a return to the land of Israel, that the Jews cannot remain stateless, that this stateless status poses a mortal danger to them. They understand that the currents in Europe are extremely dangerous and they need to get out. And that really kind of fuels the Zionist movement, which eventually ends up creating the state of Israel in 1948. And so with such a fragile... Uh, I mean, what, what's amazing is that the culture lasted all that time and the language, the Israeli language, Hebrew, Hebrew. It's just amazing to me that that actually held tight for all those years. So, but now, once the, once the country is established, you can see a real need to uh, make sure it stays. It, and, and so the, the spies would be a necessity, it seems like. And it seems like, so when we read this, we actually learn a piece of the puzzle that many of us never really even considered before. I think most people who know the story of Israel have never heard of the Arab section and have never heard of the spies who are at the center of this story. There are certain famous characters from Israeli history who people probably have heard of, people like Moshe Dayan, the great Israeli general, or David Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister, maybe Golda Meir, who was another famous Israeli prime right. minister. These spies are almost completely anonymous, not just in the United States, but in Israel as well. They've been kind of marginalized. The story has been forgotten. It hasn't been considered important, but this is the birth of Israeli intelligence. These guys eventually form one of the important seeds of what becomes the Mossad, which is one of the world's most famous intelligence services, and they play a key role in the creation of the state. So I think that the story will be new, even to people who've read a bit of Israeli mm -hmm. history and kind of have a vague sense of the history of the state. Oh, you gave me insight into the ship, uh, the President Warfield. I never knew about that. <laughs> That's right. Many of the uh, ships that play important roles in the creation of the state had previous lives. Some of them were American, and the case of the President Warfield, which was an American ferry, if I'm remembering correctly. It's been a while since I, uh, uh, since I wrote the book, but um, the, the President Warfield then uh, gets renamed and repurposed and ends up playing a very dramatic role in, uh, in bringing Jewish refugees to Israel in the mid-1940s. But there are other stories in the book that are connected to the creation of the Israeli Navy, and the Israeli Navy in its first months included a lot of repurposed American Coast Guard vessels, for example. So the characters in this story have different names and complicated histories, and so do the ships. 
Did the uh, the practice of uh, mandatory um, service in the military, did that start from day one? In the 1940s, which is when the Arab section gets going, it's voluntary. There's no state of Israel that can enforce a draft of any kind. Uh-huh. So they rely on kind of the, the dedication of young people who are here and who are um, willing to to put everything into creating a country and defending it, and they pay an incredibly steep price for it. In 1948, 1% of the Jewish population here dies in the war, 6,000 out of 600,000. So the price for creating the state is very steep. And immediately after the creation of the state, they institute a mandatory draft because they understand that with such a small population, they need uh, everyone in uniform. So there's a draft and there's also reserve duty, meaning that you do regular service for a couple of years and then you end up doing reserve duty into your 40s. Uh, that's the way the state has always been set up and that's the way it still works here for men and women. Uh, you also stated that uh, when you're undercover and things like that, you needed to be married. You had to have spouses and sometimes that even resulted in the birth of children. So one uh, one of the initial problems with the Arab section is that these guys are sent into the Arab world, but they're single, and that attracts attention. It's strange in Arab society to have single men who are unmarried and unconnected to kind of broader family networks. And the British realize that this is a problem, and they try to recruit women into the Arab section to go off and kind of pose as the spouses of of the agents. And they encounter a, a problem almost immediately, which is that. The Jewish families from the Middle East tend to be very traditional in their outlook. They have pretty strict ideas about modesty and and morality, and they were, um, for the most part, unwilling to let their unmarried daughters go off on some kind of crazy intelligence operation alone with men who... uh, who they weren't married to. Who are men. So the British managed to <laughs> find a few. Who are men, exactly. Um, they are men. And um, the British managed to find a few young women who will do it. And I quote one of them in the book. Um, but, that, but it never takes off. They can't find enough. And eventually they abandon the female part of the unit and they just risk it. They send these guys off. And it ends up in, in some... It ends up creating some complicated relationships, and I talk about that in the book as well, including one relationship that a spy forms in Beirut with a local woman, a relationship that almost ends up blowing the whole operation. So human beings are unpredictable and complicated. They're not computers, right? They're not algorithms, and if you send them off for a couple of years under a double identity, complications ensue, and that's what happened in this case as well. Matty Friedman is our guest. His book is outstanding. It's called Spies of No Country, Secret Lives at the Birth of Israel. So tell us about yourself, if you could. You you hinted earlier that you were from Toronto. Is that right? That's right. I was born in Toronto, lived there until I was 17, and came to Israel in 1995, intending to be here for one year, and that was almost 25 years ago. So I kind of got stuck. Really? I've been a journalist you, for most of my time. Are you Jewish? I am indeed, yeah. Okay, so, so that's what the attraction was. You wanted to know more. And, and isn't that interesting how, once the Jewish state was established, that um, the Jewish people around the world kind of felt like they had two homes all of a sudden. If you were in New York, you had New York and Israel. If you were in, in Brazil, you had Brazil and Israel, right? You had two, you had two homes all of a sudden. Right. The, the state is founded mainly, the urgency that leads to the founding of the state is the existence of this refugee crisis in Europe. We're talking about a few years after the Second World War, and you have hundreds of thousands of people who survived what happened in Europe, who survived the Holocaust, and who need somewhere to go. And they, that the pressure that that creates ends up kind of leading uh, the United Nations to vote for the creation of a Jewish state. That triggers the war in 1948, and, um, and by the end of 1948, there's, there's a Jewish state, and that has something... That's something that has never happened before, at least not in the last 2,000 years, and it creates a new reality for, for Jewish people. Uh, most most um, Jewish people who live in the West, so countries like Canada, the United States, the UK, stay put. So they feel an affinity for Israel, but consider their home to be America um, or Canada or, or Great Britain. Um, what happens to the Jews who are native to the Islamic world is that within a few years of 1948, the entire population is displaced, uh, in part because they're drawn to this new state by the idea of living in a Jewish homeland, and in large part because of government persecution and kind of mob violence and the nationalization of their property, and that happens in many different Arab countries. So in the case of the Jews of the Islamic world, you have about a million people displaced after 1948, and that okay. ends up playing a very important part in shaping what Israeli society is, which is a society that's half 
from Europe and half from the Middle East. Did any of the, any of your relatives from the the forties or even the thirties? Was it part of the reason why this was an interesting story to you? Do you, do you have a family connection? No, my um, my family ended up in in the United States um, in the nineteen twenties and thirties, and my whole family lives in Israel now. But I don't have a family connection to the story of these spies. Hmm. My family's roots are in. Eastern Europe, and these spies are all from the Middle East. One of them is from Aleppo, Syria. One is from Damascus, Syria. One is from Yemen. So these roots and their family stories are very different from my own family stories. Were, were you able to research uh, or do research um, one-on-one? Were there, are there any of the survivors or, or children of the, of the uh, spies? So of the four spies who are the main characters in this book, mm-hmm. only one was still alive when I started to research the story. And in fact, that's how I found the story. I was introduced to this very old former spy, and I sat down with him in his apartment. He lives in a kind of uh, working class suburb south of Tel Aviv, and I sat in, in his apartment and I heard this incredible story about how he'd experienced the founding of the state in 1948. He was almost 90 at the time. Today he's 94, and I had the pleasure and honor of delivering a copy of the book to him a few months ago. Wow. And I think wow. it made him happy. I think he felt that he had not received the the recognition. Yeah, that he I bet. And I completely agree, and I was happy to be able to kind of make that up to him in some small way at age 94. Wow. Well, good for you. Gosh, I mean, you just, you're teaching us something we didn't know about. Can, can I uh, get, get your thoughts on something? We've had... S- a number of authors, I don't know the whole lot, but who um, will tell us that they live in Israel, um, but their birth certificate indicates they were born in Palestine. They don't necessarily, um, they're not Jewish. Some of them are not Jewish. I, I, I don't know if that means that they were opposed to Israel or not, but, but and their books are often just novels. They're not even, uh, not even a political slant to them in many cases. But talk about that a little bit, the, the word Palestine. We often are not even sure what defines Palestine. The terminology here is confusing. The um, political entity called Palestine is created at the very end of the First World War when the British take over what had been a part of the Ottoman Empire and they create a mandate territory called Palestine. In 1948, there's this war. Uh, the United Nations intends to partition Palestine into two states, one for Jews and one for Arabs. The, uh, when the dust settles at the end of the 1948 war, the Jews create a state called Israel and part of the mandate territory, and the um, remainder of the territory that was in Arab hands is taken over by Egypt, in the case of the Gaza Strip, and by Jordan, in the case of of the West Bank. So the state that had been intended for the Arab population of Palestine never comes into being. And over the decades since then, there have been different plans for a two-state solution that would see the creation of a state called Palestine, an Arab state called Palestine, alongside the Jewish state of Israel for many complicated reasons that hasn't happened, and there is no political entity today called Palestine. So there's a state called Israel, and there is a territory um, called Gaza, and a territory called the West Bank, but they haven't achieved statehood. So the terminology is complicated and and very politically charged, of course, for people involved in this stuff. So in the book, I try to be very careful in the way I uh, express myself in the the terminology I use, not just for the people, but for the place as well. And you had written about uh, communication. Sometimes people were out of communication with the higher powers for a length of time, and sometimes that could get pretty scary. That's one of the amazing things about them is that they have no radio when they're sent off to the to the Arab world. So they arrive in Beirut in the spring of 1948, and they have no way of communicating with headquarters. They have no idea in May 1948 that the state has been founded because there's no communication, and they can't get letters through, and they can't get any communications through. All they know is what they read in Arabic newspapers, which it t- turns out to be completely incorrect. So one of the amazing things about months, they're just out of touch. They're sent off with no camera. They don't own a camera, with no radio, with no training. These guys were not making salaries. So anyone 
who is imagining the Mossad or the kind of mystique of Israeli intelligence as it, as it has developed, you know, after 1948, um, that's not what this was. This was <laughs> completely amateur. They, they didn't. They didn't even own a radio, and, so, and that also it adds to their heroism, in my opinion. They had really very little to work with. They they broadcast uh, their information uh, by way of a an antenna that looked like a clothesline. Is that right? Eventually, they get a radio in the summer of 1948, and that's right. They uh, disguise the antenna as a clothesline, and they begin tapping out Morse messages to headquarters in Israel. And that is really the beginning of Israeli intelligence, and I have some of those messages um, quoted in the book, and it's quite amazing to wow. see how this all gets started in the summer of 1948. And the four men came from various backgrounds. They weren't all well-to-do. Uh, no, they were actually, all of them were quite poor. Only one of the four had finished high school, and none of them had been to college. They, they came, uh, for the most part, from very poor families. One of them was the son of a janitor in the city of Aleppo, and he grew up basically barefoot in the alleys of Aleppo. So these guys were really street kids in some cases, and they were kind of recruited by this, by this outfit, and they mm-hmm. were kind of sent to service by, but these were not, it wasn't James Bond, you know, it wasn't dinner parties and, you know, the halls of power, it wasn't that kind of thing. They were posing as workers for the most part, and they were operating kind of on the lower rungs of society, and that's another thing that makes them very interesting. To me. Interesting. Uh, Matty Friedman is our guest. His book is called Spies of No Country. We do have a phone call. Are you okay with taking phone calls? Sure. Matty, okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you for calling and for waiting. You're on the air with Matty Friedman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Friedman. <clears throat> I can remember back then, well, years ago, <clears throat> and uh, I can remember a lot of the uh, uh, did what they called DPs at that time, displaced persons after the war, and a lot of the people that were in concentration camps, uh, mostly Jews, but there were a lot of other people that uh, were considered uh, inferior by the Germans, and they were tattooed. I remember the tattoos on the forearms of these people. And they were, a lot of people came here, and then they went from here to uh, Israel after 1948. The thing with the Palestinians was <clears throat> the uh, Palestinians were basically nomads. And uh, there was quite an effort to get them either to go to Jordan or to Egypt or uh, in countries around there, and it seems that nobody, none of these other countries wanted to take them in. So here they were, they wound up in uh, what I consider should be uh, Israel, but uh, we know the size of Israel is about the size of the state of New Jersey, but uh, here and there. But at that, that time, the Palestinians were... Uh, I don't know how they got the name, even that is the area that they were nomads in. And uh, it was basically the French and the British that uh, uh, made the boundaries for the various countries for like uh, Lebanon and uh, Syria and uh, Jordan and uh, a lot of the other uh, Arab countries in that uh, part of the world, mm. yeah, you know, because... That's the way it was. Uh, you think but anyway, the thing is, thank you very much. It's very interesting, and uh, I'll, I'm wondering what you thought about that, Am I, uh, what I've heard. Okay, thank you. Maddie, you want to respond to that? Sure. What you have, what you see in 1948 is this incredibly complicated moment, which you described. Uh, you know, you have survivors of the Holocaust, people who are kind of looking for somewhere to go. Uh, the big colonial powers operating in the Middle East draw their own boundaries here. So a state called Lebanon is created, a state called Syria is created. At the territory of Palestine is partitioned, at least according to the original intention, between Arabs and Jews. And in 1948, it kind of explodes into this, into this war. There is a nomadic population here, uh, which is called Bedouin, but there's also a, a large settled Arab population in Palestine it called itself Palestinian, and many of these people are displaced in the war, about 720,000 Arab refugees from the 1948 war, and that kind of triggers, um, uh, in some ways, a backlash in the Arab world against the Jewish communities who are native to the Arab world, and that creates about 850,000 Jewish uh, refugees or Jewish displaced people in the Arab world. So what you have in the late 1940s is kind of a huge human 
mess mm -hmm. that is in some ways still in play and in, in some ways the dust has yet to settle yeah. from that yeah, I think so. um, from yeah. that moment and there's a lot of suffering and a lot of um, anger that remains on on both of the sides so as a, as a journalist operating here I'm I'm conscious of I'm conscious of that and I'm conscious of the human complications of the story and one thing that I've done in this book is I've concentrated on four Israeli spies or four Jewish spies but I try to bring in the Arab side of the story as much as I can in particular because these spies were, were functioning on the Arab side of the line they were mm -hmm. operating under Arab identities they mm -hmm. were friends with Arab people in some, in some cases they were in love with women from the Arab side and, and their identities are very complicated so I'm trying to offer a story that kind of blurs that boundary between Jews and Arabs a bit and brings to the fore more of the human complications of, of Israel. It story. is one of the complicated stories of our time and of quite a few generations uh, this is an, an eye opener book uh, it's got, getting really good reviews on Amazon and other places I found it on Amazon, it's called Spies of No Country, Maddie Friedman Real quickly, do you have a website? I do. It's just my name. It's MattyFriedman.com. And any information you want about the book can be found on there. Very good. Uh, Maddie, thank you so much. We will take a break. We'll be right back. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. Here is your one-minute news brief. Florida State Senator Dennis Baxley is speaking in favor of a fetal heartbeat abortion ban that died on the...